Hello there and a very good morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Express on this 30th day of March 2015. We're glad you're watching. Time to get into the way it is this morning. Of course, a lot of what will take center stage in our discussion today is the State of the Nation address, the second one that President Uhuru Kenyatta delivered last week Thursday in a joint session of both houses of parliament. And some of those pronouncements he made there largely lauded by both sides of the political divide. But now, politics are taking center stage more of why a certain decision or directive or a certain name was in a certain list is all political is part of what we'll talk about this morning joining us in studio is uh tj kajwang who's member of parliament for raka santa sana for joining us ambrose what to do make her katikati oh yeah <laughs> lawyer <laughs> thank you for joining us hassan omar is away senator mombasa county uh this uh Monday, but with us uh, is uh, Jasper Mbioke, who's Secretary of Legal Affairs in the Office of the President. We're expecting to have Noah Akala from ODM, uh, but unfortunately could not join us uh, this morning. Uh, hence, a, a two to one on this panel. Uh, it was not. At least we are classmates, so we. we, we, we. We have respect for each other. You have respect for each other. All right, let's start on the state of the nation. The president began by saying the state of the nation is strong. I'm keen to hear your thoughts on the speech, uh, Mahashmiwa. What you thought of whether, in your opinion, it is strong and what you thought of the entire speech? Well, um, I'll, I'm due to express myself on the floor of the House tomorrow mm -hmm. about the president's speech. But like every other Kenyan now, having absorbed uh, the shock, over the weekend, I'm able to reflect upon it. What, and, what uh, shocked you? Well, it was just not real that that was uh, President Uhuru speaking. He's never done that in a long time. Mm -hmm. And coming from him uh, was uh, really a shock therapy. Uh, that's why you probably must have seen a lot of us rising in ovation. It is one of these things we've not had in years. So it is um, the apology and the directive of well, to step look, aside the, really shocked you. The, 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 the apology caught us unawares. Uh -huh. But really, the stepping aside, that was music to our ears. Uh, because, you know, uh, for many of us who have been in the <coughs> trenches for a long time, we have worked towards a situation in which uh, we would get when a civil servant, or anybody for that matter who is in public office, um, is colored in such a way that uh, can indispose him to uh, render services or uh, there is a perspective around him that makes it difficult for him to deliver his services that he himself on his own volition by his own conscience will say guys let me move aside so that i allow fresh eyes to see what it is that i did mm -hmm. and if i'm found uh, uh, not guilty then i come back to my job this is something that uh, we have uh, hoped that would come would happen. you know as, as as a tradition in as a culture in kenya but you know that um, when kibaki came in power we thought that when we took out moi kibaki would come with uh, a, a hard fist enough to mm -hmm. be able to create this culture mm -hmm. he didn't and uh, when uhuru joined his shoes it was business as usual so coming from him was really something that took us aback All but right. And, and, we'll, and we'll get into the specifics of the speech, but a quick one. Is the state of the nation strong according to you? Well, I think, uh, in all fairness, uh, the, the speech uh, uh, did cover many subjects that uh, uh, a lot of Kenyans were expecting from the president. Uh, it, it traveled from the state of economy through to the state of insecurity, mm -hmm. which are some of the hardest balls that we are looking at, and then um, and, and went into governance. Uh, so uh, the themes uh, are captured the mood, I think, uh, of what Kenyans have been saying in a long time. But that is not to say that um, in itself uh, it dealt with the substance of what Kenyans are grappling with. Uh, you see. Uh, one would should congratulate the speechwriter. I'm telling you that whoever it was that sat down to put that piece together did a good uh, job. Did a good job. Okay. Really. Did All a right. good job. Z just by let's hear from you uh, on the speech and and more so, what your views are on whether the state of the nation is strong. Uh, obviously, the state of the nation is uh, very strong. Uh, we've inherited an economy that uh, 2012, 2013 
we were expanding on range bound 5.3%. Right now we are zooming past 6%. In the next few years, we expect ourselves to overpass 7% and cross over between 2017 and 2018 to close to 7.8 to 9%. Really, that, this is unprecedented. Even Kibaki's peak, which was in the year 2007, the economy was actually expanding at 6.7%. Uh, and we inherited a slightly smaller economy. Right now, the economy is uh, significantly bigger. If you look at the infrastructure development that are opening up the entire country, it's really a very exciting journey. SGR, for example, we are 50% on uh, excavation so far, you know? And in the next two years, we expect this to be uh, finalized. Power production, it's an exciting story mm -hmm. where the lives of every single Kenyan is being touched every single day. So I believe in every sense of the word, even from a social economic perspective, even from a governance perspective, not even withstanding the challenges, for example, we had with the digital migration, I think the nation is really getting stronger and we're getting prepared for a real transformation of this country. So the state of the nation, in every sense of the word, notwithstanding the challenges that we face, is insecurity, corruption, governance issues, and issues of national cohesion, really, mm. uh, I certainly believe that the nation is strong. It's strong. Yeah. And it's good to bring in the question and the issue of national cohesion because uh, a few days ago we had the chair of NCIC where they come out and say that uh, the state of our cohesion as a country in terms of unity uh, is really doing badly. For the past two years we've seen those numbers in terms of representation in public public office just um, grow wider in terms of the gaps. Your thoughts on the fact that some came out to say that is not an issue that was addressed in the president's speech? Now, I have uh, all along said that uh, we give the president time. It's hardly two years since he came into office. And he came into office with the ICC hanging on his back. And, and I've always said this was a prince. I don't think he even had traffic issues throughout his life. Then he wakes up and he has charges against, uh, crimes against humanity charges. Mm -hmm. This was sufficient destruction. Now that that is out and he's gotten, and he's settling in office, you could see from that speech the kind of leadership he would like, the kind of uh, country. And when you come in, like uh, issues of integration, a good president who wants a stable nation and wants uh, development does not walk in and sack people left, right, inside, out. You come in systematically. So, and then when uh, it came in, the issue of terrorism, insecurity, was very, very central. Mm. Added to it was the question of corruption. So you can see that the president has taken a direction that in another two years we should be able to deal with corruption, deal with insecurity, and then all this will culminate into a deliberate policy on national integration. As we talk now, there are a few issues. There are more people here, there are more people there. But it is something that you do not wake up and take a list and say, how many Kikus are in government? Sack half of them. How many Lewis are out of government? Add a but quarter of them. But don't you agree whether it's, with those that say going forward with now appointments, nominations, there should be, at least in terms of perception, for the sake of perception, a clear effort to try and, again, counter that narrative by making more appointments that are wider in terms of the net being cast further. Because you look at now the JSC nominations, yes. right again into playing into that narrative that it's all about the two communities. Uh, I think uh, whenever you see a name of a Kiku name, <laughs> then it's like they're eating, the Kalenjins and the Kikus are eating. I think the country and the, the economy is fairly large. And assessment requires to be done either midterm or at the end of the term. If you take one or two or three isolated appointments, then you'd actually give the president a zero. But if you take the whole spectrum and then the timing, and we must also admit there are certain sensitive areas that you that must only certain communities can have? No, 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 no certain communities. Mm -hmm. Trust in lieutenants. That is the world over. Even if you go to Obama, you'll find there are certain areas, like your kitchen, you will not allow just... So let us and give the people president... from a certain community, your community can be trusted? Is that what you're implying? But if you look at their... If, take, for instance, defense. Defense is in the hands of his sister. Okay, there, there are several things, but if we choose to look at the, to look for what we want, and sometimes what do we want, we want a few appointments so that we use it to hit the president. 
that you can never miss. If no. We didn't miss it during the grand coalition. We can never miss it now. If, uh, for instance, take uh, the, the, the Inspector General. I hear some people have gone around and said he was picked from the village where the other Inspector General <laughs> came from. You can see people going deep just to, to rubbish. But national integration... But that cannot be ignored, whether... National integration, okay? You can, if, in fact, get... Uh, 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 if you take, uh, for instance, uh, the, the, the Inspector General who left, his performance was such that even his own villagers would have wished Michuki would have come back to life to help us deal with okay. this issue. So there, it, we are talking about services. If you can do well, we yeah. move on. We as move a rejoinder on JSC, for example, if you look at the composition of the entire JSC as it is right now, you will get to appreciate that JSC as a true face of the nation. We have a lawyer, uh, Justice, uh, Honorable Justice Agrium Cherule. We have a Luo, uh, the LSK representative. We have a Kamba, uh, uh, the magistrate. We have one of the commissioners leaving two years before his term expires. Just perhaps some argue to satisfy the two uh, in the coalition. The power. I, I don't so really that think that the business of any media house should be speculation. Really, it should be guided in journalism by facts. You know. It is analysis uh, that has come across the board. It uh, is analysis the that is purely speculative. Analysis that is purely speculative. Speculative yeah. because it works against what you'd want Kenyans to believe. It's not about working against what Kenyans want to believe at all. Look at the entire JSC composition. It's edited by Chief Justice Mutunga, Iskamba. There is a, uh, a smoking Wanjala who is a lawyer also. So every single community is actually represented. So why has Kobe had to leave before his time? I don't know why he had to leave. Certainly, it must be for personal Kobe, reasons. Kobe He's 90 issues. years. Kobe is 90 years. Uh, Sophie, yeah. You, yeah. Uh, you can see how holding the brief for the president is hard. Um, if you ask me, because I sit in the committee that supervises or that oversights uh, JSC, so I, I know a few things about uh, the composition of, of that uh, commission. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I also the same committee oversight the cohesion commission that you're talking about uh, and so uh, I've got some information which may not be in the public domain I'll tell you this that um, it is not simplistic just to pick tribes and, and then try to plug it in and then see that okay if these tribes or what is called the major tribes have been taken in and then the whole face of Kenya is there you see, the thing is, uh, Kenyans are a people that want to move by a culture. They want to see you walk the talk. They want to see if what you're doing is genuine enough. Um, if you cut across the appointments that we have seen over the time, that all the appointments that we have ever approved in National Assembly, you will see that there is a systemic, there is a, 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 a genre that it takes, a narrative that it takes. Uh, even right now, you have only limited it to JUC. The governor of the Central Bank is coming, and we have a whole list of the five names that have been presented to the president. It is Ngugi, Kariuki, Njoroge, and all this. Correction, there is no single name so that has see, been presented to you the see, you, you, right. see, you see, What we are doing right now well, is interview. I, 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 I will know some of the things that uh, he is talking about because from where I sit, I see some of those things before they go there. Before they, okay. Yeah. All right. I want to send, I want to hear your thoughts on this one because we saw uh, you know, in the House both, ha both sides of the parliament standing up standing ovation for the president on the apology issue on the question of corruption and stepping aside of officials who are implicated uh, but now it appears the political clouds have been drawn <coughs> all out again you have jim sorengo coming out to say carry everyone on board without any selection of a given political party so politics weighing into this that now those in court opposition feel they're being targeted is that how this conversation should be developing so if you make no mistake about about uh, our ovation that you saw, it is, as I've said, the first that we have had, that one day we'll have a president that will be able to look at issues the way Kenyans do. And, 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 and it was not an applause, if you may. It was just, um, uh, a, 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 you know, a unity of that renaissance. But I'll tell you this, that having now reflected, we are getting sober, we have digested the the substance of the president's uh, uh, address. Mm -hmm. The two issues that you're talking about start with forgiveness. You know, 
it is good, it is biblical to forgive. But forgiveness has in itself what is called repentance and restitution. Those are very strong pillars that if you don't find them in forgiveness, forgiveness is just a word. Mm. You see, uh, what I, I had a challenge, for example, trying to understand, is the president addressing uh, the families of the late Tomboya, for example? Would he be addressing the families of Pio Gama Pinto, some of the things that happened during the reign of his father? Or could he have been more recently talking about the families of Dr. Said all Uko past and all that? Yes. And wrongs. Yes, but even just the other day, uh, there are all these extrajudicial killings that uh, we have seen of people that we widely know to have been ICC witnesses. So, what it is that he was talking about, number one. But number two, if therefore he was talking about these things, when you want to forgive, then first of all, you want to state exactly what it is that you have done to the people that are wrong. We have a T T T T TJRC report. Which recommends that which that has, apology be given. Yeah, which has uh, uh, brought all these things together. You remember that, uh, that uh, the Jubilee government, uh, because of the tyranny of numbers, it has been impossible to debate the TJRC report in the National Assembly to the extent that these people uh, have not had uh, the, the chance to vent themselves out. But what is restitution? I mean, if you forgive me, you did that, and you just passed me on the street, okay. and you're the president speaking. You need to find out, therefore, how is it that you are going to compensate those IDPs? How is it that you want to compensate those guys who left Limuru for, oh. for, 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 for Kisumu? Okay, so Jasper, do you agree with Moshimura here that perhaps the president should have set out very clearly what exactly he was apologizing for? Okay, I, I disagree with Mwishimu on a number of reasons. A presidential speech, unless you want, if you wanted to be a detailed report, a speech that will be delivered for 100 hours or even two days on non-stop, cannot really go into so much detail. And His Excellency the President submitted a number of reports uh, after delivering the speech. One of the reports was actually the report on the uh, actualization of national values. And then the other report was the report on... Uh, international obligations and foreign relations and then the other report was the report of the state of security in the country so what happened in this in this case is that his excellency the president uh, did highlights of all the reports that uh, he had actually submitted the other report also that his excellency the president submitted as, as an extra to the to the report on national values was a report of the post-election violence uh, from uh, the DPP's office. Mm -hmm. And what was so obvious uh, to His Excellency's mind was that because we cannot be able to have prosecutions of all these cases because of quite a number of challenges that were highlighted in the report, then we need to move on as a nation. But we cannot really move on and ignore the pain and suffering that our people went through. Yeah. What then we need to do is that we need to address the challenges that we face as a people, but not by running away, but by confronting the challenges. And that is why His Excellency the President announced the setting up of a shillings 10 billion um, fund for, yeah, for, for, for reparations. So this will cut across uh, the, all the historical injustices from independent Kenya to date. Okay. And what is clear, we all of us have an opportunity of enacting, coming up with regulations that guide these funds that actually outline who are the beneficiaries. All right. Yeah. And all of us have really that opportunity to contribute all to right. the formation of that. And what then His Excellency the President also again drew the challenge to members of Parliament to expedite uh, the debate and the adoption of the TGRC reports. Okay. So that then all the recommendations by TGRC are then implemented. Implemented. Yeah. Um, Wada, we've had also MP here talk about uh, the question of following some of that apolo that apology rather with some action. And you have some leaders from Mombasa, including Senator Hassan Omar, saying that uh, conditionality for that apology should be, um, you know, issues of land being sorted out, being returned, grabbed land to the indigenous people. Do you think that is one of the things that uh, we should see coming quick after the apology? I think people are understanding a very narrow view of the, this apology. They think that the president coming from his house must have felt guilty of something and uh, therefore coming out to give an apology. I think that he was apologizing as a president of the Republic of Kenya. On our behalf, we have transgressed against each other. There are so many th wrong things we have done against each other. There are so many things the government has done against the people. 
There's only, there are many things. So as the embodiment of the nation, you will say, take my apology. Let us move from here. So to come round and then an apology is an atonement of sins. You say, I am sorry. I acknowledge something went wrong. Now, to be skinned over land, this and that, is to rubbish that mm -hmm. apology. Mm -hmm. and, and then to take us back to the anger that we had. I really, really think that that demand brought us down such kind of apology. And even the spirit of the apology. And we should not take it in that perspective. We should look and say, Your Excellency, what you've done is right. Let us now develop our country from that perspective. We, the, the people who died, even during the post-election, post they are dead. We only can only appeal to Jesus Christ to come and raise them, but they are dead. We are only saying we are sorry this had to happen because of elections, because of disputes. But now, when people want to come in and say, "Oh, my cousin also, my cousin lost a chicken, my uncle lost a cow," all the, we will go back to the chaos. So our leaders, including Senator Omar and the rest, should know what forgiveness is all about and should talk responsibly in a way that integrates this country, not divides it further. Oh. Let's talk about that list of shame. We've seen cabinet secretary step aside and we'll get more into the, what the, the, the legal language and what stepping aside comes with and what it entails. But when, again, to the question I asked earlier, you have Orengo coming out to say that now this is a political witch hunt. Really, is that what should, we should be hearing from opp opposition just because we also have some of your own um, mentioned in this particular list now complaining because they're part of the mess? Well, first of all, let me just say that uh, I feel a little uncomfortable to trivialize an, an issue which I think is very emotive in the hearts of Kenyans, but I won't press on it a, a lot. I'll come back to the question you ask. Um, first of all, uh, you, we need to separate what is an individual uh, 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 expression uh, on a matter and then what is also corporate. And, um, and I think that uh, Senator Rengo uh, is wearing several hats here. I, I can hear him, first of all, expressing himself as a person that has been uh, named. Um, but two, I also see him as expressing uh, certain thoughts of uh, the people that uh, he associates with. Uh, coming to the list of, now the list of shame, uh, uh, f you know, the way it plays out is the manner in which the president is handling the whole thing, really. That is the problem. You see, look at it this way, that this list is coming from the Anti-Corruption Commission. This Anti-Corruption Commission is said to be independent. And it's said to be having enough teeth, or is supposed to be having enough teeth to deal with these issues. Then what do they do? They hand it over to the presidency. What are they saying? They are saying that uh, either they are unable to do it, or that the problem is in the presidency. You guys, you are the problem. So you have the <coughs> stuff. But uh, that is not just enough. The president has all the means, all the with the wiggles, to be able to, um, uh, you know, rein in these things or um, what stop things them out. exactly? Because he threw it back at you. The challenge of VACC. He said it's up to you. In yeah, the but that's where I'm coming to, to, to Sophie. Because that is the it? that is the strategy of the tragedy of the matter. That the president of the nation throws this back to the legislature. What are we supposed to do with this list? We are not prosecutors. We are not judiciary. Neither is he. Well, he is not, but he's the president of the country that uh, embodies all these three arms of government. I mean, he, he can come. He can fire senators. No, no, no. He can, he can come and bring that commission and say, you guys, you have to deal with this or give me your letter of resignation. You're going to do this thing because that is your job. As the executive, he has that authority. Now, he brings it to the legislature. You know, I don't know what we are going to do with this or whether he just wants us to hold this baby because it's a stinking baby. So you're unable to remove ESCC officials if you deem them unfit for office? Well, we should and we are going to do it, I suppose, because, well, maybe I'm speaking too fast because there is a petition before us and uh, really coming into my committee uh, to be able to reflect on this. Um, uh, um, I'm sure that that petition uh, it will raise a lot of uh, information but without judging that uh, petition, Parliament has the authority to, you know, uh, uh, disband that commission or reconstitute it. But that is not the point of the list of shame names. These names, what are we going to do with them within 60 days? Because they have been brought to us. I mean, we would have dealt with these commissioners with or without those lists of names. 
uh, because we are working not on what the president says, but what the petitioners will bring, the evidence that will be available, what the society will say. But let me just, as I finish, say this, that um, it is a great thing. I mean, some of the names that uh, are there are names that uh, have been spoken out about uh, publicly. Mm -hmm. And it is good that, of course, the president have shaken his backside and said, well, I do not want these guys, sleaze guys, to be around me. And, and, and the only problem, I think, that when he now conditions it to 60 days, I wonder what these guys are going to do within 60 days. How long would you have had it happen? For? Well, I think that uh, the president should have reflected on this. This really will take some time. I want to think that this is something, in fact, for okay. urgent prosecutions, for us to see urgent prosecutions, mm -hmm. probably three months was the right thing to do. About 90 days. All right, Jasper, let me come to you. You have Gidongo and others saying, this stepping aside of CSs and other officials in public office is something we've seen in the past. It is just to, you know, uh, tamper all the very high temperatures we've been seeing over the past few days. It's all political talk, it's PR, even others have described it as that, and have argued that the president should walk the talk by pretty much just firing some of these people. Do you agree that there should have been more action, more strong indication from the president that he's serious about this one graft? Uh, I don't think it can get more serious than it has actually got us. Uh, but before I do that, let me respond to uh, uh, the Member of Parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, notion that the, His Excellency the President cannot be able to request for a report from any independent commission. I think casual reading of the Constitution, Article 254, is clear that all independent commissions will, every single year, after close of every financial year, report to the National Assembly, a Senate, and also to His Excellency the President. The following Article 254.2 goes on to say that His Excellency the President, or even Parliament or Senate, Parliament can actually request for a report on any issue from any uh, independent commission or office. So what His Excellency the President did is that pursuant to that article, he wrote to ESCC uh, requesting for a status report on all the um, continuing investigations. And that is the report that he tabled under the confidential uh, submission that he did uh, before the House last week. Mm -hmm. The context that we are in is that it was a state of the nation address. Mm -hmm. He was not addressing the nation from uh, the loans of State House, but he was addressing the nation from Parliament. And therefore, uh, if he re his report is going to be debated in Parliament, then His Excellency the President could not have said, oh, following this speech, then I'll proceed to State House and release the name of the persons that are, are named in this, in this context. So the natural thing to do was then submit all these annexures to the House for debate. And then to the issue that you're talking about, uh, this being a PR or otherwise, yeah, I think it's very clear. Days, it's, it's, very clear it's very clear. It's very clear that uh, His Excellency the President is required that to communicate every single decision he makes in writing pursuant to Article 135. So what he, he did then on Saturday, uh, following uh, the State of the Nation address, is that he wrote to every single affected member of a cabinet. Uh, principal secretaries and all the other uh, top state uh, officers that were affected, uh, that were mentioned in the list, and they were actually effectively suspended. Mm -hmm. They were effectively suspended. But who says they'll not come back into office? Uh, whether those who it's not in my business to, to speculate whether they'll come, come back, back to or, not, or not. Or not. To sack or not to sack outrightly those that have said that's what the president should have done to show that he's serious and means business. One, one side, the president does not want to obey the constitution. The president is uh, sabotaging the constitution. On the other hand, when he follows, say, no, 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 stop it, sack them. Surely, there must be some investigations. Who does that? The DPP. The DPP. The law, as he has explicitly stated it, the president has to receive reports. Now I ask the DPP, what do you have? The DPP comes with a long list saying, oh, this is your friends, this is your guys, so and so is being investigated, so and so. The president walks to the National Assembly, as required by law, to Parliament and says, gentlemen, on the state of corruption, I have the following investigations. But as we talk now, they are sitting in those offices. Some are sitting on some of the relevant files. Some have locked the files in their drawers. Okay, some are very powerful. So when people from ICC, uh, the, uh, DPP comes or uh, the anti-corruption comes, small guys, you can't just tell the minister, can be, mm -hmm. excuse me, wait outside, I'm checking. So what we are going to do now, I'm going to ask them for 60 days to stay in their houses so that they leave the keys 
so that we can walk in and read those files. That is what we call due process. When the president is following due process, then the member of parliament tells us he should have just sacked. Okay. Surely, let after the due process comes in, then some people will be charged. Some will be cleared. If you are charged, too bad for you. If you are cleared, hallelujah. But at the end of it, right. I think these people also owe the nation a duty. That when you are you have been suspected, the mere suspicion, I thought they would honor the president and the people of Kenya with a resignation. The elected leaders, before we get away from this, because there's quite a lot in this first state of the nation and the issues which is brought up, and we'll talk about Chris Okemo as well shortly, that appointment. But uh, the elected leaders, many of them have come out to say, like uh, Isaac Ruto, the Bomet governor and uh, Council of Governors chair, that, you know, there's no right. They've actually brought up the ICC issue, which uh, the State House spokesperson responded to, saying that if that's the case, the DP should as well uh, be stepping aside because he has uh, proceedings going on the International Criminal Court. Should we be seeing these governors, senators, and whoever else that's an elected leader mentioned as well step aside? Uh, let, me, let me put it this way. First of all, picking up from uh, where Utino Weda has just left, uh, first of all, let me be fair to the president's team. Uh, really, as the people who have been wanting for this culture to take root, this is the best that has ever happened, however small it is that we are now coming into a culture where where somebody is suspected of you know sleaze or you know uh, putting his fingers where he shouldn't have that he himself well it has not come to that at least somebody is telling him step aside so that we can check on this but that is just good enough uh, and we hope that it is not going to just end here but it will go into you know chapter six is a broad thing and chapter 10 of the constitution is a broad thing uh, these things we should be taken in one into one context to create a kenya that we aspired to when we promulgated the constitution i'll come directly to what the politicians say and in this i really differ with them with a lot of respect i think that uh, this is uh, trying to have the cake and eat it i mean if there is um, uh, investigations or suspicion to uh, your actions whichever place you are whether you are a, 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 a public school teacher or whether you are a, a, a member of parliament like i am i think if the this kind of issues arise if your in, name in is there watch, you should step aside yes i should step, step oh, aside okay. although it it I, i'll wait for the lawyers here to interpret what i will do to step aside because i cannot step aside as member for waraka i probably will take a walk and uh, avoid the presence of national assembly for some time as they investigate me but you yeah. see that is the inconsistency that we have in the law but i think that we should uh, there are other cases that we're talking about for example you're talking about um, uh, isaac for example uh, isaac i mean who's my good friend and my classmate we were with him mm -hmm. and, and the weather in class but you see the mere mention that certain things are not correct when you should as they think they should be the pontius or the the, the you know should you should be that clean you should be able to step aside okay. or the deputy president for example it may not be a question of corruption but an issue that is taking you to court and really about the deputy president he has actually even been convicted on some of these things so you see stepping aside is a culture that we need to you know to, to, to put into our, all right our and system. what i will come for you to clarify for us what this stepping aside would mean for an elected official for a member of parliament governor who then would act what would be the implications of the same on them uh, but, but to you jasper uh, the criticism that also the president received after his speech and all of this directive on corruption is that uh, two weeks or three weeks prior to this crystal Kemo had been um, appointed to the board of the kenya seed uh, uh, body and the concern here is that there's an international warrant of arrest outstanding against this particular person so on one hand two steps forward one back with this kind of an appointment what do you say to that uh, what i say is that that appointment to the board of kenya seed was uh, gazetted effectively gazetted by the cabinet secretary minister of agriculture uh, mr felix koske perhaps that's the reason why he stepped aside okay yeah simple and straight to the point this stepping aside 
what is in terms of the legal interpretation what does it now mean are these cabinet sectors going to be on half stepping, stepping aside uh, for lack of another word would be ordinary like go on compulsory leave please take some leave so that you leave the office and the keys for us to check through so for elected leaders mm -hmm. we understand for elected leaders they never go on leave <laughs> the day they are regular and sworn yeah, so they are they're clean so society has evolved although there's the law that deals with if you are charged with issues relating to corruption and so on then if you're a public officer you're supposed to uh, be suspended but that's not for elected leaders mm -hmm. but society because law evolves society has evolved something called stepping aside and it would be effectively take some leave go on leave so that we have access to our offices to our documents so that we check on you your activities so these people are saying i'm elected i can't step aside just go and leave go, go somewhere and uh, leave the keys we will check and clear you or then we get enough evidence to nail you and uh, i agree my classmate here also says if we were to be investigating ruaraka constituency for three mm -hmm. he would be able to say okay let me go down to to to, to somewhere in uh, <laughs> ruenzori mountains for two weeks or three weeks, uh, then go into those offices and check this. Our leaders must learn to give you space. Let's hear from Jasper and I'll come to you shortly. I'll come to you shortly. Jasper. Uh, in regard to members of parliament again, if for example it's a parliamentary committee that is under scrutiny, then the obvious thing to do, the natural thing to do in that regard, is to ensure that the members of parliament that sit in that committee step aside, literally meaning they resign from that committee. If it's the business, uh, if the undertakings under a, a specific parliamentary committee that okay. is under scrutiny. Then let's proceed to governors. Governors are involved in execution of an executive function, mm -hmm. unlike members of parliament, actually, whose role is principally oversight. But governors are involved in the day-to-day -day running of various counties. So if they're involved in the day-to-day -day running of a counties and they are under scrutiny, will they not in any way act uh, in a way that will... Uh, uh, cover up, uh, you know, the undoing or whatever that is under investigation. So the natural thing to do for governors, for example, is to actually step aside, literally, meaning actually sitting office and even handing over to the deputy governor. Yes, okay. Yeah, until the investigation until are finalized. Are done. Because naturally they can interfere with the investigation process. Okay, briefly. Well, yeah, very briefly. First of all, coming to studio has been a blessing this morning because now I have learned that these guys are actually suspended. They are now, suspended. Now, yes, that is something that uh, I'll take home okay. because that must mean <laughs> that uh, somebody is on half pay or somebody is on there is a sanction that uh, somebody is going home with mm -hmm. there is a pinch to it um, uh, I, I know that there is uh, a gray area in this subject when you come to elected leaders unfortunately for me because I think that really uh, we should not be inconsistent. If guys are going to leave office to allow investigations, even us politicians should find a way of leaving office. But I also th see that uh, governors are also heads of governments, as they call it, mm -hmm. the 47 of them. And I see here that um, it would also lead to a, a, a serious lacuna, a, a serious constitutional problem uh, if governors were to, so to speak, uh, get out of office. But they, ha they are deputies. Well, uh, I'm not so sure whether they are do those deputies are able to take the constitutional functions that they have mm -hmm. uh, in, in this kind of context that we, we, we are talking about. All right, our time is running out. So the, in, the, in, the, in, this context, in this context, actually the governors have no capacity. They're incapacitated. Okay. And instances where govern and, uh, uh, the deputy governor can actually act as a governor are in instances where governors have no physical or mental capacity to discharge the obligations oh, yeah. just like we saw in Yeri four months the governor was away the county was still running okay briefly again to you uh, I'll ask this TJ Kajuang MP Raraka we had the censure motion that flopped oh. against the National Assembly speaker uh, now some of the members in your coalition in your party have been harsh critics of the speaker and his leadership and one would have imagined in this particular occasion they would have in no uncertain terms been clear about 
his removal or his censure, if you like, uh, at that particular time. But only five people uh, were in support of that particular motion. Very many of your uh, party members and coalition were very safe in that particular debate. What are your thoughts? Well over uh, is the tradition of uh, most Commonwealth uh, parliaments, not even just Commonwealth. I see it in a cross-section of all jurisdictions that I know that uh, censor motions do not belong to party positions. These are uh, decisions, debates which members uh, conduct on their conscience and based on the facts that they find in the House. So you will find in most cases uh, there will be no weeping around uh, this but kind when of they've subject. been criticizing harshly well, outside in press conferences and then when it comes to the rubber well th the this road. is true but as i tell you that uh, the approach that a member would give to a subject uh, if it if he is not whipped then will mean that he will be discussing what the facts that he has before him on every particular thing that comes before the floor the thing is that uh, first this was not um, an impeachment uh, so to say yeah. of the speaker it is even not quite a censure uh, it is really talking uh, uh, speaking about a speaker adversely uh, adversely mentioning his conduct i mean that could be a uh, splitting of of, of airs, but yeah. but but the, th the thing is members came expectant that uh, the member that brought this subject would bring issues that members who would rally around, members who would find so it was substantial, so that uh, it was not buffed with uh, the kind of information that members were looking. It is not uh, extraordinary that uh, members have discussed a speaker uh, adversely. It happens okay. all the time. All right. But you see, members would really want to... It is the last gun that we always have. It is the last bullet. So we do not want to waste it on uh, friv uh, frivolities. We want okay. to take issues and wrestle with them. One of the issues uh, last week in uh, the Senate session was on devolution. And um, in his submissions, the minority leader, Wetangula, uh, talked about the devolution ministry being scrapped off, uh, also accusing the same uh, ministry of being a conduit of government and con corruption. Of course, Kindiki asked that he withdrew the statement. This um, enlisted heated debate thereafter leading later on to Halwale being thrown out of the house. In terms of devolution, because today the Council of Governors also has a um, notice uh, put out in the dailies on the state of devolution, the progress and challenges. Those that look at devolution as a ministry that should not in fact even be there in the first place because what? Devolution is up to the counties. Why is there a ministry at the national level handling those matters? Your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are uh, pretty obvious. Uh, Wetangula has become the master of whining in this country. But that aside, if you look at the entire organization of His Excellency the President's government, one of his key uh, pillars of that establishment was actually decentralization, devolution. In appreciation of how critical devolution is to spur the development of this country, opening up the entire country, mm -hmm. His Excellency the President thought instead of having a half-time state department because there is that requirement within the intergovernmental relations act uh, dealing with devolution then why not elevate devolution uh, into a ministry so that we have a, a cabinet secretary reporting to him uh, attending cabinet uh, meetings driving this devolution process mm -hmm. and it's in that realization that the ministry of devolution was established to fast track devolution and the highlights of this process has been what was required in the law for us to be able to transfer within five years three years actually we did it within the first year uh, of present Kenyatta's governance it means actually we fast track this process three years uh, ahead of time that actually shows you uh, why we are today to an extent reaping the uh, fruits of our uh, devolution in this country mm. yeah as to how devolution minister of devolution being used as a conduit uh, to channel uh, the so-called uh, deal making within 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 the establishment i find it totally nonsensical well yeah. uh i think uh, there's uh, is the minister of devolution and planning I, I see no problem with it it does not in any way interfere with uh, uh, devol but there must be an organized channel just like the attorney general is like the cs in charge of justice mm -hmm. so in an organized government there must be somebody specifically responsible at the national government level and i think that one is the minister of the world 
these people to take their time to debate whether there should be a cabinet secretary all those is actually shows that they have very little time uh, for real issues real issues like uh, censoring the your speaker which him to renew himself so that next time he's a better speaker because we want him to be very good right uh, well uh, coming today I have listened to my younger brother and uh, this is the problem that we have and I think that is what uh, uh, what Moses must have been talking about mm -hmm. you see uh, the, 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 this government has not accepted the principle of devolution as a philosophy they are still looking more like a decentralization i thought i had those words coming it is not decentralization it's devolution it's gone the baby is gone down to the people uh, and 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 the national government is still trying to hold clutches back trying to uh, uh, macromanage um, uh, what goes down there and I like think, what? Give me an well, example. Uh, for example, the devolution ministry, you see, uh, the fact that the devolution ministry is still appearing to be designing policies around which, for example, uh, um, um, functions, uh, you know, uh, functions are given out to counties mm -hmm. in itself is a way of controlling what it is they can do there. And that is why you had the uh, Council of Governors saying, we are mature. Give us everything. We can take it down, all right? Um, and even if it uh, cannot be done through that fashion, it need not create a ministry to be able to deal with this other than to just to clog the process. So I think uh, that devolution ministry, give it planning. Yes, we must plan uh, as a national government. But devolution, unless you want to keep a strong eye, uh, because you really want to, you don't want this baby to go. That's why you have Sophie, for the last five years, years yeah. for the last at, uh, five year, ten years of Kibaki government, we're in the constitutional making process, mm -hmm. we're the Ministry of Constitution, Constitutional Affairs. In the present Kenyatta's first term, we're in a transition again. The tr greater transition is towards de devo de a devolved unit of governance. The natural thing for His Excellency the President to do, so that governors don't engage in someone they're looking down upon, you know, uh, someone nearly at their level. I have a cabinet secretary elevate the process to that level so then this process this transition is fast tracked you know and this transfer of functions it's not an event it is a very long elaborate process you have witnessed it, it yourself mm. it has been a largely transformational process okay. however how painful it has been we must end i uh, hope i can be just two minutes uh let, well, let me put this to you i was in Baragoya about uh, two years ago yeah. with the killing of 40 officers there it's an area that has had issues yeah. uh, of insecurity you have the new inspector general of police just saying that uh, they've given the rustlers there 48 hours to surrender stolen animals and illegal weapons office and specified consequences we had that after the killing of the 47 police officers there have been so many and a lot of this stuff talk what must happen in this particular region, barrel going, and, and what has been happening, cattle rustling, and all of that to end? Because all we hear is tough, tough talk, but not much action. I, I think for us to deal with the cattle rustling, actually, we must mark this cattle. Uh, I saw it in another country. We must mark them. The new IG seems also to, to, to be getting into the old methods of issue, threats. Those areas, they are large. They are larger than Nyanza province and Western mm -hmm. combined. Mm -hmm. I think he has not gone there. He doesn't understand. We must address the question of cattle and how we'll stop this cattle from leaving this place to that. And then we need a buffer zones, buffer zones between these communities. These are comprehensive things that require money, require planning, require time. Somebody better advise the new IG that that method of issuing warnings for the eight hours, 24, to even return. The, the, the older Kenyatta yeah. did it, Moi did it, Kibaki did it, Raela did it. We are still so we should actually now have new approaches okay. otherwise we still have the same problems dealt with with the same uh, solutions and we are down where we used to be let him come come up we we is young and and, and uh, ipad material let him look at the world how it is sorted out Brief. when Less did Raila do it my brother but <laughs> <laughs> <Co -prince. laughs> uh, sophie you know when uh, president uhuru uh, uh, you know tr changed um, the ministry and uh, the minister of interior and uh, when uh, the, the cs of interior 
and when he also acted on the IG and requested for his resignation, mm -hmm. those were very significant. I thought the president uh, was now changing tact that we would have a stronger an iron fist to deal with security. We have talked about insecurity. There is no time that passes that National Assembly does not adjourn to discuss insecurity. I think what we need to, uh, to have now is a commander-in-chief who comes hard down. And I think that uh, Boynette should, uh, have, uh, should have read the mood of the president, that he needs to be seen uh, all the facilities that goes with government should be down there. You know, I, I am not advocating for a kind of a military world, yeah, but I'm thinking, that. I'm thinking that no Kenyan would want to steal each other's, cow, each other's cow when he knows that government is on my back mm -hmm. and has everything to deal with me. I think we need a stronger action. We just not need the ultimatums. We need the entire force, the police force, and even to come for our approval in the National Assembly for okay. military force to be present there. Well, we'll wait for that ultimatum, those 48 hours as they lapse to see what action will be taken. If any, TJ Kajwang, MP Ruaraka, I'm Roswada Lawyer, Just Pambuke, Secretary of Legal Affairs, Office of the President, we thank you for joining us on The Way It Is and that is The Way It Is as of... Uh, 8 12 a.m on this 30th day of march 2015 we're glad you're watching morning express do not go away in the next hour michael gitonga will be all about trauma how to deal with that in different cases whether it's uh, in sexual harassment we talked about quite a lot of that last week and many of those people who go on, who undergo some of these very scary treacherous experiences go through a lot and for some, it's important to go through counseling. Some do, some don't. Why is that important? How do you go about it? It's a conversation that uh, Mike will be leading their gender on. So do stay with us right here on KTN.